everybody and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. We're coming at you, <coughs> excuse me, we're coming at you live this evening from Hoss Tools headquarters here in Norman Park, Georgia. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. We've got a great show planned for you tonight. Tonight we're going to talk wheel hoe attachments, go through all of our kind of cultivating weeding attachments, talk about specifically what they were designed for, how they're made, kind of some, some neat stuff like that because yep. we've got a new attachment I want to tell everybody about then we're going to do some show and tell here in just a second and as always answer your questions at the end of the show and if you have any questions during the show please put those in the comments and we will get to those next week so um, as far as the show and tell goes we've got some pretty <coughs> transplants in the greenhouse and these are ready to go i planted me a row of these earlier this week and uh, these are those tiger collards we got yep and so that's the kind of the substitute for the top bunch ones we had and uh these things look really nice I yeah i got some down the expo that's really kicking along good too so uh it's gonna be interesting to eat some of those and see what they taste like uh, i'm assuming they're gonna taste real close to what the top bunch does and i'm gonna put me some chilean nitrate on mine here in the next few days really get them the pop yeah good. yeah these these greens are kind of heavy feeders in a certain stage when they're getting up and trying to get a hold and going and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to hit them pretty hard and pump them up and get them going. Now, I'm going to lay off when it comes time to, to be eating them a little bit because I don't want all that nitrate in the leaves. So the time to hit them is this stage here, a little bit larger, get that growth going, and then you can kind of back off of it just a little bit. And these right here, you can do it just like that lost and of kill and just crop them leaves off the sides yeah. and they'll keep I, growing. I've never done that, but I've seen that picture you posted on the Row by Row group, and that's interesting. That's why we used to do collars a long time ago. But those look good. You know, they've made it all the way since February. Yeah. We, here's some, we've got these in the greenhouse ready to go. I might go plant me another round of them. One thing I have noticed when they get tall like that, it takes a lot, a lot of water. Because mm. you, you push it. That plant, it ain't got the same, this vegetable plant ain't got the same cellular machinery, so to say, that a tree's got to be able to push that water up that high. So it has a, and we've been so dry that it's uh it's yeah. been tough. So I'm probably gonna plant me another round. I might let those go just see how long they make it though. Yeah. Yeah, and that's La Sonata. That's right. remember that, and that's an older tag <coughs> in the heirloom. In, in the kale family, it's probably my favorite. Yeah, so we really like that. And we even got some uh red Russian. Red Russian's another good one. That uh is ready to go <coughs> in the ground yep. too. As far as the kale goes, the La Sonata <coughs> seems to uh, hold better in the fridge than some of the, the the more frillier ones. It's got a thicker leaf on it. Right. It holds better in the fridge. Um, things going good at the expo? Things are going good down there. We're, we're getting closer <coughs> and closer. I seen John Deere's already moved there exhibit in so when they move it in you know it's getting to be crunch time. We got a little bit more stuff to plant. We got everything pumped up running along good. So uh, I'm excited about it. I feel a little bit better now than I did a week or two ago. My insect pressure fell off just a little bit with this uh, people gathering the cotton and peanuts. Uh, there's not as much host plants out there. So my white fly pressure has went down a little bit and that's helped me a lot. So things have pumped up looking good. Corn's growing like crazy down there. So uh, yeah, I think it's gonna turn out good. Speaking of the white flies, I saw a video on Facebook the other day uh, Taylor Farms, which is right up the road, they were talking about that uh, University of Georgia is doing a big study on those. And it ain't just us small guys having a problem with the white flies. The, the big uh, produce farmers around here are taking yeah. a big hit from yeah, them. Yeah, they got about a 10 acre research, <laughs> a 10 acre research farm up there. They do a lot of uh, groundbreaking work on the commercial side of things. But yeah, white yeah. flies give us lots of problems. Those big guys use got some tools that we don't use in the vegetable garden. And, that, that helps them a lot on uh, white flies. I just refuse to use some of the tools that they have. But yeah, everybody suffers with it. This year it didn't seem to be quite as bad as it's been in the past, but it still causes some issues. And uh, the, one of the last things we got to plan at the expo, we're gonna do a little cover crop montage. And uh, we got a little spot there. It's probably 20, 25 feet wide yeah. and we're gonna we're going to plant warm season cover crops because they'll get up uh, quick. But we're going to have them in little four-foot swaths there. 
and kind of be able to show you what they all look like and that uh, that should turn out real yeah nice. we should have some footage a little later on to show that but it's going to give people an idea how quick those things grow and the difference in them so there's different reasons you would plant different cover crops and we're going to cover all that down there you know we may even do some hands-on demonstration little workshops out there in the expo during that time to tell people all about that and answer the questions and, and stuff like that my, my chickens have been getting mad at me because I've been keeping them hemmed up on a chicken tractor and I think I might might try to squeeze me in a little bit of that sorghum Sudan in a little spot and let them... Uh, I think you still got time. And let them, let them eat on that. They quit laying eggs when I don't let them yeah. forage out. So we're going we're gonna to try to keep them happy. So um, that's what's going on around here. Still dry. We ain't had any rain in probably a month. Um, but we're making it. And now our tool of the week... So my corn has started tasseling and silking. And corn, when you talk to people about corn, the most common problem they have, pest-wise, is that corn earworm. Mm -hmm. Is to get on there and eat on the top of that corn. Um, there's some studies out there that say BT works little, some that say it don't work at all. But the consensus is, as far as organic controls goes, this stuff right here, the spinosad, is the way to go and this is a uh, comes from naturally occurring bacteria much like the BT does this stuff here is a little more powerful than the BT mm -hmm. now when you go to spray this on corn and we're gonna get into this a little more in detail in a two-minute tip in the next few weeks but you want to do this once you start seeing the silks and you got to put it on the silks and, and, and get some good coverage on the silk. Well, let me tell you the issue I've had in the last day or two down the expo. We got corn and broken <laughs> corn about this big down there. And I had worms eating on the leaves, pretty, pretty substantial damage eating on the leaves. And you can spray this right here. What happens at nighttime, I mean, worms is gonna come out and feed on them leaves. And during the daytime, they're gonna go back in that middle right there and they're gonna stay in there because it's, they, the, the birds can't get to them. They, they safer in there. So you can take this right here and actually spray when your corns are about yay high if you start having some worm problems, which I'm having down there, and you can kill those worms. Now, with this product here, you're probably gonna take more than one application. You're probably gonna hit and hit two or three times and you need to be pretty good about wetting that leaf and make sure it gets down in the center of that corn where that worm's at. This stuff here has two different modes of action. It can kill on contact and it can also kill by ingestion. So if you get it on, you're gonna kill them. Plus if they eat that leaf and got this spinosad on them, it's gonna kill them. So that's one of the great things about this, uh, this product right here. Yeah, as far as the ingestion uh, mode of action, it takes about uh, 48 hours to kill those worms. Uh, and you wanna stay on about a four to five day schedule mm -hmm. with this stuff as far as frequency. So you're spraying it. And we'll get into a lot more of that with a two-minute tip. But I, I've started with this right here. I probably could have started a little sooner because I noticed some of that damage on the leaves too. Um, but this is your go-to for your corn. Your and worms. one great thing about this product is you don't have to worry about resistance. There's no known resistance to this chemical here where you do with some of your other products where the insects can build up resistance to it. They don't have that problem with this. So it's a great product to work into your rotation. If I would give one caution there, the only thing, and not necessarily with corn and worms because it's not an issue there, but on some of the other, uh, some of the other Maybe tomatoes, tomatoes, and especially <laughs> cut flowers, if you have it, it can be a little rough on some of your beneficials. So that's the only caution. Spray it late. Spray it late and use it kind of a last resort. Now, on certain situations like corn or earworm, you don't have that issue to worry with. So I'd blast it real good. You ain't gonna have bees on your corn. Yeah, but that would, be, that would be the only caution I got there is kind of use it as a last resort on, on certain things. I personally use neem oil and pyrethrin as the first attack and then I come back with this later on in the season. Yeah, yeah. Usually on mm. most everything else, BT handles the worms fine for me on the corn. This stuff right here yep. is a good too. All right, let me set that down right there. And now into our main segment this week. So if you well, kept up with any of our videos, any of uh, you're on our email newsletter list, you saw we came out with a new attachment called the Wing Sweep. And everybody's been really excited about that. And so I wanna go through the show today, go through our attachments. A lot of people ask questions, what's the difference between this and this? When should I use this one? When should I use that one? All that yep. good stuff. So let's kind of start out with our simplest and uh, we'll get to the wing sweep and kind of work through some of the others. It can be a little confusing because we have got so many different attachments there and they all got their purpose. That's right. <clears throat> so the first one we got here is just 
our basic cultivator tooth. You buy a wheel hoe, you're gonna get a set of these, either a set of three or four, depending on which wheel hoe you get. And, and these are nice everyday attachments. We even did a, a two minute tip on these being underrated. Um, you can move these around. You can use one at a time. You can use two, three. I don't like using more than about four because the dirt doesn't flow through them very easily. Believe it or not, I actually like it better with three than I do four on there most of the time because it gives room for that soil to move around there. If you got four on there, it's kind of like a blade pushing through there. Especially if your dirt's a little yeah. wet. <clears throat> so I, most of the time I'll use three and space them out more so than I will three. My favorite time to use these right here is after rain when my dirt's kind of got padded, uh, settled down and I want to bust it up. That's my favorite time to use those right yeah. there. Getting there before it dries out mm -hmm. when it's still a little wet and keep that crust from forming yep. and keep your dirt nice and workable. This also works good if you're doing a bed of greens or something like that and you want to incorporate a little compost in the top. Oh yeah. These right here are going to be the trick. So that's our, our kind of simplest attachment. Now moving on to our new ones here, which are kind of almost like a variation of the cultivator tea. So these are our wing sweeps. And Planet Junior had some of these. They call, that's what they call a sweep. And uh, look very similar to this. And all, what, all we're doing here is taking cultivator teeth. And got a nice weld on it. And people have been asking, what's the difference between these and the cultivator teeth? Well, first of all, it's wider. Mm -hmm. And it's going to bite more. Yeah, because it's got more of an angle now. Let's see if I can turn it this way. So if this was the way it was hooked up level, you see the incline there on there. So you're going to get more bite. And it's going to reach down in there a little bit better. It's also a little, it's sharper than the cultivator teeth. Mm -hmm. And it's going, those heavy grassy weeds, this thing is going to go Now keep in mind, up. this is a cultivating tool. This ain't for digging up grass and ain't digging up new ground. This is a cultivating, it should be used in work soils. That's right. But if you do get some big weeds in your garden, these right here can handle it. And those wings right there, what they do is they keep any weeds from sliding off here to the side. They kind of yep. gather them all <clears> in that weed. Yeah, and there. also, if you was using these to straddle, like on the high arc or whatever, you could use these wings right here to stay off from your plant. So you can move them in and use that as the gauge, not get into your plant, but you could get fairly close to it. It'd be, it'd be good for that. And uh, we hadn't had these long, so I hadn't had a chance to experiment with every possible configuration, but there's a lot of different configurations out there. You can use up to three or four of them on a wheel hoe. Uh, you can use two or three of these. Lots of different possibilities. Yep. And, and one of the main reasons we came out with this is we had a lot of people asking for a four inch oscillating hoe, which it may sound simple, but it, it's not as easy uh, the tooling to do it. And, and this right here, we thought was gonna be a better solution to that. Yep. So those are our new wing sweeps. Check those out. Six inch, four inch, mm -hmm. you can get them a set of two or a set of three. Yep. And then to compare those, we've got our regular sweeps here. Now, this is what we call a sweep. Old Plant Junior piece, people used to call these beet hose. Beet hose. Yeah, <clears throat> that one right there. And on all these blades, we started powder coating. These blades are sharp, but we started powder coating the whole thing just to keep them from rusting. When they're in Actually, our warehouse. Zinc plated. Or zinc plated. Zinc plated. And um, as soon as you put these in the dirt, it'll reveal that sharp edge yep. right there. <clears throat> these guys here are more for your light duty, frequent cultivating. You don't want to use these if you got real hard dirt or if you got real heavy weed pressure. Yeah. So the benefit of this is, is this wing part right here, you can get real close to the plant so you can cultivate Basically all your middles you can even run your mitt you, you can straddle a row here and you can you can gauge these things so that you can get real close to the plant. The downside is you have to be careful you're gonna to get too close to cut your plant and plus this outside here doesn't have any support. <clears throat> so this is probably not the toughest equipment we make, but it's one of the most versatile and you can move it around and you can get real close to that plant. Yeah, these things slide through the soil like butter. Yeah. But you if you don't wanna if you got say some real thick crabgrass what can happen is that crabgrass root to grab hold of this and, and uh bend that because it mm -hmm. ain't got any support there yeah right when your weeds are coming up uh when they're small you want to hit them with your sweeps and i think they work fine for you and you'll love those but for your light duty stuff <clears throat> go with these 
Then we got our heavy duty. So this along with the wing sweeps is going to be for your heavy duty jobs. But in my opinion, that's the toughest implement we make right there. So this is our oscillating hoe. We got it in six, eight, and a 12 inch wide. And these guys here are pretty daggum strong. Yeah, this is quarter inch material all up in here. Quarter inch steel. Now this right here is thin, but this is what calls spring steel, which is a 1095 high carbon steel. And folks, I'm gonna tell you, that's some tough stuff right there. We sharpen these things with a knee mill right here. So you got an edge on them. But if you got something that you really want to dig up, your weeds get ahead of you a little bit, this is the tool to use. It's supported well and it'll take some abuse. Now I have had one or two of a break and we replaced them for folks. I don't know how in the world they did it, but they did happen. But uh, this is the absolutely the toughest tool we make. And for edging the side of your garden, yeah. keeping that edge, keeping the square shape or whatever your garden, this right here. Uh, works really well. This is going to be able to get them thicker, tougher, grassier yeah. weeds. We may have overbuilt that thing just a little bit, but it is what it is. We want to make it tough. And uh, we are working on a hand hoe version of this um, that will have a six inch wide version. Maybe. 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 We, we're working on it. Nothing concrete yet, but we are working on it. So the we'll, wheels are turning. We'll see. We'll see. Stay tuned for that. As far as those attachments go, <clears throat> mention this little piece right here. This is called our spreader bar. And so this is gonna allow you to kind of increase your versatility as far as some of these attachments go. These things won't accept the cultivator teeth currently as they are. Right. We do have plans to make it so it will accept those. We just have to change this, this space in here. But with the oscillating hose and the sweeps, uh, even the plows, even the plows, these things are going to afford you a little more versatility yep. as far as how you want to spread these out. And then you've got the plows right there. Yeah, so we redesigned these things a few years ago, and this is some pretty thick material here. Also, got an edge of point on them right there. And the plows, I guess, it's probably our most popular <clears throat> implement. <clears throat> you can put them in there and make a middle buster and dig you a trench and that's real important when you dig it I mean when you plant potatoes so you can do this right here And then you can turn them around and put them on like that and you can make them in a hiller position Which is great for healing potatoes coating them up corn all different kind of things And you can spread them out so even with our high arc you can get these things pretty far out and make you a bed you could make you a raise a small raised bed with these right here if you if that's what you like to do is to plant on the bed. That's what some the older folks call that making a row. Making a row, yeah. Oh, um, making a hill, whatever. Yeah. You can do that with these right here. We've actually done some 21 inch beds. We planted microgreens with these things. So the plows are a great implement right there. Healers, furs, uh throw soil to corn, all kind of things. So you got your left and your right plow. Yep. Your left plow is always going to throw dirt to the left. Right. Your right plow is always going to throw dirt to the right. Now you can use one of these at a time on the single wheel hoe. And it just doesn't matter which one you have. If you've got the right one on, you're always going to have the row to your uh, to, to your right. Yep. If you got the left one on, the row is always going to be your yep. left. So it doesn't really matter just just kind of which way you walk in. If you got, or going to plan on buying a single wheel hoe, one plow would probably do you if you got a small garden, but if you're getting a little double or the high arc, by all means get to set, because it's going to save you a lot of time. Yeah, yeah, you're going to really get the, the maximum usage out of that. All right, and then the last one we want, we want to uh, talk about here is our disc hero here. And now some people get a little confused. This is not going to work like a disc hair on a tractor where you in there busting up deep down heavy. This is more for light duty cultivation. Scratching. Scratching, uh, helping the soil dry out a little maybe. Also works really good for some fine seed bed prep there right mm -hmm. before you plant. Maybe breaking up some clods, getting everything nice. Uh, nice and broken up and and we you can change the angle of these blades right here it's got a little quick pin right there so you just pull that out change to this you can actually be you gotta be careful you can get too much on there you just want a little bit offset so when you run down through there it scratches up that soil 
and uh, tears it up a little bit. We do not recommend these in hard clay soils. We recommend these for more sandy loam type soils. Yeah, there's not enough weight <laughs> to push it down in really hard soils, but your, your softer soils, I use mine mostly for incorporating cover crops. So once mm. I hand broadcast or, or you know spread the cover crop seed out, I'll run over the top with this and it does a great job of covering up that seed. Yep. So that's our disc here over there. Well, you said last one. Let's talk about our drip tape attachment just, just a second. Okay, go ahead. Well, we come out with this a couple of years ago, and we've got an attachment. We'll show it up here on the screen. we got an attachment called the drip layer attachment. It goes on our little double wheel hoe so that you can actually lay drip tape out by yourself. This used to be a two-man operation force because we had to run a broom handle or a dial through there, stretch it out, come out covered up. So we come out with this in, uh implement a couple years ago and it saves a lot of time you can lay your drip tape out and this is an att attachment for only the little double wheel hoe but you can you can lay your drip tape out and cover it up with just one man operation it saves you a lot of time yeah that drip tape layer uh, I tell people if you're gonna do a lot of drip tape it's worth having an extra double wheel hoe just, just for that, that yeah. just for that on I can go out and lay out you know 10 rows in 30 minutes with yep. that thing zoom zoom mm -hmm. no problem so it's really fast so hope y'all enjoyed that if you have any questions about these yep. attachments that you don't have that you're thinking about getting what can they do what can't they do let us know we'll be glad to answer them for you or yep. uh, talk you through it so i was over the weekend i was in north georgia and we went to the we was up there trout fishing living off the land a little bit mm -hmm. so saturday morning we went to blairsville the locals call it blairsville blairsville <clears throat> they had a farmer's market there and i'm gonna tell you it was one of the best farmer's markets i've been to in a long time if you're ever up in that area you definitely want to visit it they spent some money and they got a really nice facility they had a lot of farmers there a lot of stuff it was really interesting to go to and i've seen some things i hadn't seen in a while there was a farmer there that had some georgia excuse me they call them north georgia candy roaster squash now those they say are pretty hard to grow down here because they they're fairly susceptible to pests and stuff i have grown them here in the spring it's been a few years ago now mine got pretty good size but these they had up there was huge uh, it's the first time it's like I've a seen, big old banana. Yeah, almost, it looks like a big old banana. But it's the first time I've seen them in a while. We have trouble growing them here, but if you're up north, that may be something you're going to Now, this is an old heirloom variety. They don't make a lot. So don't, it makes a huge squash, but they're not, they don't make a lot of them. So you have to kind of give a little bit, it being an old heirloom, it's not as productive as some of the newer type squash. But it's very unusual, and North Georgia is known for this particular type squash, and uh, I thought it was interesting to see that. I wish I'd have took some pictures of it. Also, they had there, <clears throat> they had some beans, which was a shelling bean that we don't grow much of here that I would like to, to try more of, but this was a shelling bean, and it was white with pink stripes on there. I've seen a variety similar to this called Dragon's Breath before it, but I would like to know more about that, and people out there have grown these type beans before, you know, give us a little information on, but this was a very, it was very bright, vibrant colored bean. Yeah, some seed companies I've seen called Dragon's Tongue, Dragon's yep. Breath. Yep. Uh, I, I always thought it was a fresh eating bean, but they had them growed out for shelling. Well, this was, no, this was fresh beans. I uh, mean, you, you actually shell them and you can even fresh or dry them either one, but this was a fresh, they were being picked fresh. And that's something here in the South that we just have never grown much of that I think we should. Uh, it's something that I want to do in, in the future, but uh, that was very interesting. Uh, I always like to go to the farmer's market, see something new, see what people are doing in other areas. But if you're ever in the North Georgia mountain areas, check out the Blairsville Farmer's Market. That's good to know that farmer's market is, is alive and doing well. Some of these around home here are, are struggling. struggling a little bit, but it's good to know some areas of yep. the country they are doing well. All right, so uh, let's get into our Q&A segment this week. And uh, we answer your question this week. We'll send you uh, a free horse koozie. Just uh, send us your address there and we'll get that koozie out to you. And our first question this week comes from Daniel Crow. And he wants to know, well water versus tap water, what's the pros and cons and the effects on plants? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. <clears throat> well water, for the most part, they, they, they can manipulate or adjust the pH sometimes, which is probably the biggest issue, and they can put fluoride in there. Talking about city water. 
tap yeah, water. Yeah, excuse me, excuse me, tap water, seeded water. They can put uh, fluoride in there, and they can put chlorine in there. They do this for a reason, because they have to, and they can adjust the pH. Now, I don't think the chlorine and the fluoride at the amounts they put in there has a huge effect on the plant. If I had my druthers, I'd rather use well water, but if I had to use uh, city water for that, I, that wouldn't be my biggest concern. What would be my biggest concern would be the pH. And this is what I always tell people. You need to know the pH of your water, whether it's city water or whether it's well water. And all you got to do is take your sample of it and carry it by your local pool store and ask them if they run a pH on it, and you'll know. The reason it's important to know that because that has an effect on your soil, especially if you have to do a lot of irrigation. Now, our well water here runs about 7.8 pH, which is high. And, and what can happen there is if you do a lot of irrigating, it can adjust the pH in your soil a little bit. It can bump it up, especially calcium. Calcium can cause some issues. If you have a lot of hardwood, it can cause some issues and large settings on this drip tape of stopping it up. In garden situations, we don't have a lot of issues with that. But hard water normally is a little rougher on drip tape than, uh, than water that don't have so much calcium in it. But pH in your water is important to know. You need to know that it's easy to find out. And once you know that, you can kind of adjust things. One thing I will tell you about high pH in your water, whether it be well water or seedy water, is I don't care what kind of pesticide you're using, it will degrade it rapidly. Mm -hmm. So regardless of what kind of pesticide you're using, whether it's a natural or synthetic product or whatever, if you mix it with a high pH water, you need to use it all up right then. If it sets overnight, it's going to lose its efficiency. What's the, what's the efficacy? Efficacy dramatically. In other words, the strength of it's going to go down. I've heard people say, "Well, Roundup don't work like it used to," and I asked myself, "Well, how long did you? I mean, how?" What's your process there? Well, they mix it up and they leave it in the tank two or three days. Well, overnight, it's lost at least half. <clears throat> your pyrethroids, your synthetic pyrethroids are notorious for degrading these high pH uh, waters. But even your natural products, anything that you mix up, if you got a high pH, you go ahead and use it all out right then. And when you need some more, you mix it up again. Another thing can happen is if you're irrigating a lot, you can run into some problems with uh, iron chlorosis. So you can, your pH can get up and your iron's not available to your plant and you see these leaves that's got the green veins in it and you, your leaves are turning yellow somewhat. It can tie up some of those irons and those other micronutrients and, and cause problems there. So know your pH of your water. I think that's probably the most important thing to know about water, whether it's well water or city water. All right, good, good talk about well water versus tap water there. <clears throat> and our last question is from Walt Lars. And uh, he wants to know where to lay the drip tape if he's about to plant some onion starts. Now, we ain't too far from planting onions. We're about a little over a month away come yep. November. Uh, beginning of November, as soon as Dixon Dale can get them sent to us, we'll be ready to plant onions because yep. you want to plant them as early as you can. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way I've been doing it for the last three years, and I, I haven't written any scientific papers on this, but I've got some... Um, world's evidence that this is an extremely effective way to grow onions and so go ahead and lay your drip tape down I do mine rows about three foot apart because you can stack onions in there that leaves me just enough path to run my single wheel hoe down the middle so put your drip tape rows three rows apart and then plant your onions on both sides of that tape about I'd say four to six inches all the way down the line and where you can let that tape run all night sometimes, those onions will soak it right up and uh, you'll have some really good onions. Yeah, especially if you like to pull them early. I like to pull green onions early and eat those and that gives you plenty of onions for that. I always plant my onions too thick on kind of that. But four to six inches is pretty much ideal. And if you want to plant them in a single row, you could do that. I, I'm like you, I like kind of like double stack mine on each side of the tape sometimes, but you could plant them straight in a row if you wanted to and put them about six inches apart and I think it'd be fine. Plant, put your drip tape down and put your transplants right beside that uh, that tape. Let it bubble up where you got your spacing where you see your emitters out on 12 inches. Plant one on each one of those and then one in the middle if you're doing that single row of uh, planting. Yeah, yeah. You, I don't know that you want to put onion starts right on top of the no. tape like we do tomatoes or anything else. So you're going to put them to the side, but I as well put them to both sides of that tape. Yep. And uh, you'll have some good onions. And we'll, we'll do some more onion videos when that time comes around. 
All right, so that's going to do it for us for tonight's show. Hope everybody enjoyed it, and we will see you guys on next week's show. We're going to talk a little bit about some uh, gardening fads, some back to Eden, mm. and some permaculture stuff yeah. like that, and uh, maybe why that don't really work for us. Yep. All, All right. right. Well, have a good one. See y'all next week. Mm.